Hi everyone, let's now revise the chapter meeting of board and its powers. So this is a huge chapter containing a lot of sections and very important from your examination perspective. It commences with section number 173. But before we start section 173, let's have a basic understanding of how board takes its decisions. Now, why do board need to take any decisions? Because company is an artificial person and company cannot take decisions on its own. Hence, the decision making powers are being distributed over a board of directors as well as the shareholders, right? Whenever board has to take any decision, that means any issue comes up in front of all the directors collectively known as board, they have to resolve the decision, they have to resolve the problem. So a resolution is passed. What is resolution? Majority uh, or you can say voting happens, right? That is all the directors have to give their assent or dissent whether they agree that this should be done or they disagree. If majority of the directors who are present and voting agree, then we consider that board resolution is passed. However, if they don't agree, we consider that the board resolution was put forward, but it is lost. So the decisions of board of directors are being taken by a board resolution. Now, sometimes section 186, section 203, you also have unanimous board resolution. There is a difference between board resolution and unanimous board resolution that is UBR. This is that whoever is present at the board meeting, so all the directors present, they cannot refrain from voting, they cannot abstain from voting, they have to vote and they have to vote in favour. So when all the directors present vote in favour, then a UBR is passed. So UBR is not required at all times, it's required in two sections. Uh, in Companies Act and in fact it's required under a rule also but that is not something that we are going to consider right now. Now, how this board resolution will be passed? Undoubtedly ma'am, all the directors should come together then the issue will be told to them and then they will resolve the issue that's how things happen. There is another way of passing board resolution which is by circulation. That means the decision of board can be taken either at the board meeting or by passing the resolution by circulation. Now this board meeting may be virtual, it may be physical. It may be virtual, it may be physical. Earlier we had this provision that some matters cannot be dealt in at a virtual board meeting but now there is no such restriction and all the matters can even be dealt at virtual board meeting or the board meeting that's being um, conducted through video conferencing, right? So this is the general thing. Now, one thing which is imperative from this discussion which we come to know is that we must meet, that the board of directors must meet in order to take decisions. And since their meeting is mandatory, they must meet. Companies Act has put in some mandatory requirements about board meeting. Starting from section 173.1, we come to know about the minimum number of board meetings which every company must conduct. See, board meeting is, uh, the matters can take place or uh, they can, um, uh, directors can go directly from their place also through circulation, resolution by circulation, but that is something which is not allowed for every matter. There are certain matters for which it is clearly specified that you must need to take decisions. Okay, uh, you have read section 161. In section 161, there are four parts, section 161.1, additional director, section 161, two alternate director, section 161.3, nominee director and 161.4, casual vacancy. Now, out of these four, only 161.4 says that resolution at board meeting. That means this is a section which clearly specifies that the resolution has to be passed at board meeting only and the resolution cannot be passed through circulation. So a lot of times matters are being specifically reserved for board meeting. 
So for all the other three cases, you may have a resolution by circulation, but not for this one, right? So there are restrictions which have been imposed. Moreover, we have a section, section 179, which says that certain powers are exercisable by the board only at the board meeting. Okay, so although decisions can be taken through circulation also, but still it is imperative that the board meet. So that all the directors are aware about what is happening in the country and moreover to take the decisions which have been specifically reserved for board meeting. Okay, now what is the requirement? First board meeting has to be held within 30 days of incorporation and thereafter every company is going to have a minimum four board meetings in every calendar year. In every calendar year. The gap between two board meetings is not going to be more than 120 days. So maximum gap 120 days. This is the general rule that we have for all types of companies. However, there are certain exemptions. Now, before I go on to exemptions, you have to understand that even if the meeting is adjourned, that also has to happen within the time limit specified. That means if you call a board meeting, it is adjourned and held after four months, the gap between two board meetings should not exceed 120 days. So this applies to adjourned meeting also. Now, for Section 8 company, we have the requirement minimum one meeting in every six months. I hope you understand and remember the difference that I have told you in classes six months and half year so that's a difference and you must understand and remember that so section 8 company one board meeting in six months opc small or dormant company one meeting in half year minimum gap should be 90 days minimum gap your maximum gap was specified here minimum gap no private company which is startup again the same thing as of uh, opc small company and uh, dormant company opc with one director only the section doesn't apply See, meeting, introspecting, all this does not happen when you're talking about company. When you have to take the decisions of company, you are the only one to take decisions why you will call a board meeting and meet with your own self. Obviously, no. Right. So, you will not meet. Then comes your section 173.2, which talks about video conferencing. That means a board meeting may also happen through video conferencing. I'm not telling you over a telephonic call or a teleconversation. No, it has to be AV, audio, visual, both. So it may so happen. That means a director, if he is unable to attend the board meeting physically, he can also attend the board meeting virtually. So we have a whole procedure which is being listed when the meeting is happening uh, virtually or when the directors are participating virtually. So what is the procedure that's going to be followed? What are the requirements that are going to be followed? What is needed? So section 173.2 read with rule 3 and 4. So that's how we are going to read it. I mentioned this before that earlier there was rule 4 which prescribed certain matters which could be dealt only at a physical board meeting but now those matters have been removed that has been omitted. So now we don't have any matter which is specifically reserved for a physical board meeting. Okay, fine ma'am. So a director can attend in person or can attend through video conferencing only. The only requirement is that whenever a company is going for a virtual meet it has to ensure that whatever setup it is establishing it is capable of recognizing the people and recording the director's presence and um, storing everything along with date and time moreover moreover the chairperson and this company secretary who are responsible for convening a board meeting they have to make necessary arrangements to avoid any type of failure and have should take reasonable uh, care for these. See, whenever a board meeting is happening virtually, it's a welcome move. Undoubtedly, it's a welcome move by the government. But there are issues with respect to confidentiality, security and other like matters, right? 
if we are in a closed compact conference room and a board meeting is taking place we are sure that no one else who is not entitled or authorized is listening to us but if we are sitting here out in open and everyone is participating through different places there might be some insecure surroundings there might be right so this raises a doubt on the confidential matters <coughs> of any company however duty has been imposed on the director as well as the company that director also has to ensure that you are not around anyone and the company also has to ensure that the director is sitting alone and only authorized access is being given to the um, in the board meeting <coughs> right fine so what has to be taken care of security and integrity availability of equipment all the proceedings will be recorded and thereafter minutes will be prepared you have to safely keep the records for future you have to ensure authorized attendance only as i just mentioned however if a person is disabled and request for an attendant then that person will be allowed one and ensure proper audio visual okay so these are the requirements which must be fulfilled and then only you can go for vc what is the procedure and one more thing is av mandatory if a director is unable to attend a board meeting he requests the company to provide for audio visual facility the company ignores and rejects the plea is it valid i would say no it is mandatory that you provide uh, audio visual or video conferencing facility to the directors if they want that okay for this we also have a case law ajintya kumar now what is the procedure because normal board meetings people come we come we see things right we see things we hear things we are in a closed compact room how the things are going to happen over video conferencing that is also the procedure which has been laid down what is the procedure the first requirement well if you want to call someone for your birthday for your anniversary for anything you must give an invitation right or even if it's not a very formal invitation you must at least notify if i want to call you for a class i will at least have to notify when that's going to happen uh, where it's going to happen at what time place all these details right likewise when company wants to call its directors either physically or virtually it's it's their choice they have to at least inform the directors how do they inform the directors by sending notice what is to be included in the notice that we will read in section 173 3 later on in the same section we have the provision of notice also but right now i am concerned about one particular part in the content of notice that is an option of vc so when a director receives the notice of board meeting from the company informing when uh, uh, board meeting is going to take place he is also given an option that the meeting may be uh, you can participate in the meeting through video conferencing and this is the information with respect to that right so this is the disclosure that's given in the notice i have received the notice so i will attend the meeting but this is something which is not very common or it's becoming common but i have to intimate the company that i am going to attend through vc so that company can make adequate arrangements if i don't intimate anything it is deemed that i am going to attend in person fine so i inform the company the company made adequate arrangements keeping all this in mind and i attend the meeting through video conferencing in the mode as has been specified by the company what happens is that at the board meeting the chairman is going to ensure quorum the next question arises what do you mean by quorum quorum is the minimum number of directors which are required to constitute a meeting only then the meeting can proceed the question is ma'am do the quorum need to be physically present or it can be virtually present see it may be a situation that all the directors are virtually present it may be a situation that some are physically present and some are participating through vc never mind 
the directors who are physically present as well as the directors who are virtually present, they both are counted for the purpose of quorum. So we count the physical directors if they're present, it's a physical vote meeting, right? And that uh, we don't need to compute further, right? So that is how the case is. Once quorum is there, the meeting begins. Then happens the roll call. Roll call is like an attendance. You must have seen a lot of CBI inquiries or police inquiries in movies and web series. What happens? They ask or they interrogate and the first thing that they ask the um, accused is that tell your name. Although I know the name but still I ask them to tell the name for the record. Right, same thing is happening here also. The directors are being asked to tell their name, the place from their attending the meeting, the fact that they have received the agenda and um, the confirmation that no one else is around. So they have to give this for the record. Although the chairman clearly knows that particular director, but still a roll call happens for the record. Then what will happen? Of course, the meeting has started, there will be people discussing and then there will be voting. So when the people are discussing, there might be these directors also who want to participate and contribute to the discussion. So whenever they contribute, they will identify themselves. And if their voice gets disturbed by any means of disturbance, they will repeat it. Okay. And then voting happens, voting again, roll call, voting, roll call, voting, that's how it happens. The chairman at the end announces the summary and everyone, uh, if they have any objection, they can raise it. After that, the minutes are drafted, that is the true and fair, correct summary is being recorded or is being put in writing. Once it is written, it is circulated to all the directors who attended the board meeting, okay. So they have the chance, they have the option of uh, raising or of commenting on the accuracy within seven days. If they don't uh, comment on the accuracy or if they don't have uh, anything to say, it is deemed approval. And if they have anything to say, accordingly, they raise that objection. After that, it is going to be entered in the minutes book. The minutes book is prepared under section 118 and is open for inspection under section 119, right? And is signed by the chair person. Clear? Fine, ma'am. Then we have a section 173.3 which talks about the notice of board meeting. See, what are you concerned in the notice? You have to inform the directors. What do you have to inform? Date, place, time, venue, option of uh, VC and agenda. What are we going to discuss in the meeting? Right. And when have we have to inform that means if the meeting is commencing at 1 p.m. I cannot call at 12 and say the meeting starts in one hour at this particular place. Right. A lot of cities where the traffic is huge or commuting takes time. They will not even be able to reach even if they are willing to and they leave immediately. Then also they might not be able to reach. Right. So there has to be a sufficient time given to the directors to prepare themselves for the meeting, to make themselves available for the meeting. So ideally seven days time is required. So company gives seven days notice to all its directors, to all its directors. No particular form of notice, seven days notice in writing to every director either by hand delivery or by post which has a proof or by electronic means at his um, address which is registered with the company. At his address which is registered with the company. If you don't give notice then 25,000 fine on <coughs> officer in default. Fine. Now I said one particular point with a lot of emphasis that is agenda. What is it? Agenda is the matter which we are going to discuss. Now, Companies Act does not make it mandatory to give agenda along with the notice. However, as a part of good secretarial practice, it must be sent. And if we talk about the practical world, it is always sent. Because the directors must know what are we actually going to discuss. However, this may so happen that three agendas are specified and the chairman wants to take up another matter which is required and a board meeting is already in existence so they can take up that matter, right? 
simple reason being because the agenda is not mandatory under law. Fine ma'am. Now, a lot of times this also happens that uh, we don't have time. We don't have time to wait for seven days to discuss a particular matter and that's why we want the directors to come together at a shorter notice. So this is also something which is permitted for urgent matters but there is a requirement. What is the requirement? That one independent director must be present in such a meeting which has been called at a shorter notice. Now, this may so happen that uh, that, in, that no independent director is available or no independent director attends that meeting. So, there is another solution. What is another solution? It is supposedly a shorter notice is given, meeting called, no ID attends it, no independent director attends it. So, circulate the decision to all the directors and if at least one independent director ratifies it, then it's going to be valid. Ma'am, what about the companies in which we don't have independent directors? This is not the requirement. So, you can call the meeting at a shorter notice. Simple. Okay. So, this restriction has been placed on those type of companies only which have independent director. Okay, sometimes students have this confusion that ma'am, can board meeting be held on a holiday? Yes. Can it be held outside business hours? Yes. Can it be held uh, outside um, the city or registered office? Yes. It can be even held outside India. Okay, so board meetings that is something which is very well possible. Okay, fine. Now, section 173.4 is only about the penalty that I've already told you. Moving on to the next part, section 174, that is quorum of a board meeting. Quorum is the minimum number of members which are required to constitute or to validly conduct a board meeting. One third of total strength or two, whichever is higher. Although articles may specify an even larger or higher quorum, articles don't have the power to specify a lower quorum as it will be non-compliance of law, but it can specify a higher quorum. So articles may say that in my company, the quorum will be five directors. So irrespective of what section 174 says, you have to have at least five directors to constitute to conduct a board meeting. Fine. Okay, fine, ma'am. Now, what if, what if? the quorum is not present, what is going to happen? The meeting will be adjourned. If quorum is not present, the meeting will be adjourned according to what articles say. If the articles don't say anything, it will be adjourned to same day, same place, same time next week. Supposedly at the adjourned meeting also quorum is not present, the meeting will be cancelled. In general meetings, we have read the opposite. What we have read in general meetings is that if in the adjourned meeting also quorum is not present, the members who are present shall be deemed to be the quorum. This is not the case in case of board meetings. Fine. So in board meetings and general meetings, this particular provision is different. Fine. Okay. Now, now one more thing that you have to understand that what is interested directors who are interested directors we have a section section 184 in which we talk about the disclosure of interest and like things see there might be a situation that I am a director and the company is entering into a contract with my father. So I would definitely want that this contract should take place because I'm interested. Somehow I have an interest and therefore my discussion, any contribution to the discussion, any contribution to the voting cannot be unbiased. Or even if I am so competent to be unbiased, the come others might not believe it, right? They will still have the feeling that I will give a biased opinion only. So companies act prevents such a situation and tells the directors who are interested to not be a part of such meetings, to refrain yourself from participating in such meeting and voting in such meeting in which you are interested in any contract. Okay, fine ma'am. Now, 
supposedly there are supposedly there are nine directors nine directors and out of which two directors are interested so one third of nine comes out to be three three or two whichever is higher so out of these seven remaining directors you can have at least three directors who are present and they will constitute the quorum that's not a problem because interested directors since they cannot participate in the direct meeting they are also not a part of quorum fine but let's imagine a situation there are nine directors and out of which seven directors are interested so if we i calculate one third of nine it will be three we don't even have three directors who are not interested because seven directors are interested we just have two non-interested directors so in such a situation there will never be a quorum so for this situation it has been specified that if the interested directors at any time exceeds is more than or equal to two-third of the total strength and higher of number of disinterested directors or two directors shall be the quorum okay it shall be the quorum now one relaxation in private companies because in private companies you will be interested in almost all the contracts and you are only the member you are only the director so if you are interested you are allowed to vote it's just that you have to give proper disclosure so this does not apply to a private company now for section 8 companies quorum is different 25 percent of, of total strength or eight directors whichever is lower however in no case it shall be less than two okay now let's imagine a situation ma'am my articles say that you need five directors to be the quorum and i have only three directors so how because my three other directors have died so how can i get five directors how can i do or conduct a board meeting in such a situation you can call a board meeting even with lesser number than the quorum to increase the directors or to call general meetings so for these two purposes even if even if there is uh, no quorum the directors may act okay section 175 passing of resolution by circulation one thing that i have already told you that um, resolution by circulation is not allowed in all cases for the cases where it has been specifically mentioned that you have to uh, deal with this item at board meeting only then board meeting is needed we are reading about the notice we are reading about the quorum all for the board meeting not for passing resolution by circulation so here we don't have any such requirement what is the process then ma'am you draft a resolution attach necessary papers which help the uh, directors to take a decision and send it to all the directors by hand delivery post or email at their address if you get approval by majority then in the subsequent board meeting you will note it and include it in the minutes that such a resolution was passed okay sometimes it may so happen that i have received this draft resolution and i sincerely feel that uh, this is a matter which should be taken up at the board meeting because it needs a lot of discussions so if one third of directors require that the resolution should be passed at board meeting then then chairperson shall decline this particular thing and they will call a board meeting and the matter is going to be decided at the board meeting clear the matter is going to be decided at the board meeting then comes your section 176 a very small section which just talks about the defects or you can say validity see a lot of times it may so happen that uh, we appointed a director his appointment was defective or um, some disqualification gets attracted to him or he has to vacate some office some grounds of vacation has been attracted to him but he doesn't know the company is not aware in such a situation he continues to act as a director even during that period of disqualification for say six months seven months now during this tenure he has 
um, passed a lot of resolutions, he has taken a lot of decisions, he has entered into a lot of uh, transactions with other parties, third parties. Once we come to know that his appointment was defective, that means he was not a director, proper director, and that means all the acts that he has done as a director are not proper. That means we have to reverse all the acts, the answer is no. Section 176 gives us a clarity that if the director appointment was invalid by reason of defect, disqualification or termination, then whatever acts are done by the company till the com whatever acts are done by the director till company becomes aware of it, they are going to be, they shall be deemed to be valid. Okay. So after his appointment has been noticed by the company to be defective, thereafter all the acts will be invalid. But before that, the acts will be valid. Okay. Before that, the acts will not be considered to be invalid. Just a second. I try hard not to waste your time because I understand you are into such um, heavy professional studies and at this particular time, if uh, at this particular point, if I am asking you to devote one hour with me, then I have to understand the importance of that one hour and I cannot um, uh, be like uh, only half an hour to be productive and half an hour some chit chat or this example or that joke. So. I refrain from cracking a lot of jokes when I'm into serious studies. Of course, for the flow, for keeping the classes entertaining, you know that uh, we need stories, we need jokes, we need situations every now and then. So that has to happen. But of course, when I'm doing this continuous revision, I don't want to waste your time. And that's why I am trying to be as quick as I can. If um, you still want that the flow should increase somehow, you can increase the speed, but uh, I wouldn't uh, a lot suggest you that. For the topics wherein you are very confident, you may skip this revision, you may increase the speed, but for the topics you are not very confident, then this is going to help you only, right? So you can revise along with me. I'm trying to cover all the aspects of all the, the complete section. I'm not uh, leaving anything for you. Now, section 177, audit committee. See, 177 has two aspects, audit committee as well as vigil mechanism. And section 178 has NRC and SRC. First, we'll talk about section 177, audit committee. Or as of that matter, any committees that we're talking of, what are these committees? They're nothing but a group of directors of the same company. So they are dedicatedly being appointed to the cause of something. When I'm talking about audit committee, they have been some directors who have expert knowledge in finance or who understand finance, who understand the financial statements and all, who understand how audit is being conducted, what is the importance of audit and like things. They are being um, included in this committee. What do they do? They see that which auditor should come so they can give recommendation with respect to auditor, his remuneration. They can see how audit is being performed. They can see other internal controls of the company. They also have to approve some related party transactions, right? So they investigate into certain matters. So not just audit, but overall control of the company. So they have certain powers and they have some certain functions that they need to discharge. So they are going to oversee all those things. Okay. Ma'am, do we need audit committee in all types of companies? The answer is no. See, as the company grows and expands, then you need specific expertise areas. Otherwise, one person can handle it all. One person can handle audit also. He can handle the employees also. He can handle the operations also. So even if you have two directors, they can handle everything. But as company grows, you need different dedicated team to handle things. So the companies which are required to appoint independent directors, the same companies are also required 
to constitute audit committee okay that means listed public companies listed public companies or public companies which have paid up capital of more than equal to 10 crores turnover more than equal to 100 crores loans more than 50 crores so these companies are required to constitute audit committee which is mandatory jv that is joint venture wholly owned subsidiary dormant not uh, applicable to them so they are not required to constitute now we need to understand what is going to be the composition of audit committee what are the powers that they have been given what are the functions that they need to discharge or they need to perform any disclosure and punishment for not doing it the punishment is not given over here it is given under section 178 so we don't have any punishment which has been specified in section 177 for the non for contravention of section 177 also the punishment is stated in 178 only okay now composition minimum three directors of which majority shall be independent and with the ability to read and write uh, sorry with the ability to read and understand financial statement they have to be financially literate not just literate okay what do they do they recommend auditors remuneration one important point to note over here that they recommend they cannot impose their decisions on the board. It is board's discretion only whether they want to appoint or nominate um, uh, the auditors. Auditors, appointment of auditors is a matter of ordinary business which is being dealt at the general meeting of the company, but board nominates the name of the director, uh, nominates the name of the director, the, uh, nominates the name of auditor. This name is being suggested by the audit committee when an expert is giving you a recommendation you must follow it although it is your life your decision you might not follow it but when you reject that experts recommendation you must have a strong backing reason for that the same goes for the board board if you are rejecting if you are not accepting the recommendation of audit committee, you must disclose the reasons in the board's report why not, along with the composition of audit committee. Fine. So they recommend, then they review auditor's performance, how the auditor is performing so that we can give a feedback, no, this auditor is not correct, we should not reappoint this auditor or this is performing brilliantly, what is happening, right? Then examining the auditor's report if auditor has given any uh, qualification in his report then you are going to discuss it with the auditor why this particular qualification has been given if it is a clean report no problem at all right but then you will see on what aspects auditor has examined on what aspects auditor has not examined what are the things that are happening in the company so it also acts as a bridge between the management as well as the auditor then Scrutiny of loans, assets, internal control, monitor use of public funds, additional things and approval of related party transactions. So section 177 out here is read with section 188. Is read with section 188. One by one we'll do it. Now, to discharge all the functions, you also have been given certain powers. You can call for comments of auditors, you can review financial statements, you can issue, discuss issue with the auditors, you can investigate and oversee vigil mechanism. Just, we'll do this later after we do this. Fine. Now, what is related party transaction what is related party transaction for this you need to understand what is a related party section 2 clause 76 defines related party company the director of company relative of director kmp kmp's relative any firm in which they are a partner 
any private company in which they are member or director any public company in which director or manager is a director and holds more than 2% of paid up share capital of the company along with its relatives then uh, any um, body corporate according to whom you are acting or um, uh, the body corporate who is acting on according to you uh, <clears throat> then we have holding subsidiary associate investing company subsidiary of holding any other as may be prescribed so all these are related parties all these are related parties company enters into a contract with the related party company is buying some goods from related party now this is a contract which is specified in section 188 i'll repeat section 188 has seven specified transactions if entered into with related party needs approval approval from audit committee approval from board and if ceiling limit exceeds then approval from members also so audit committee approval board's approval as well as members approval if ceiling limit exceeds members approval is needed only if ceiling limit exceeds right that means you need audit committee's approval also so audit committee will grant the approval fine ma'am audit committee has an option to give omnibus approval also what is omnibus approval it is one time approval see if the transaction is not covered under section 188 of course you don't need to give any approval you can only give recommendation if the transaction is covered under section 188 then you need approval but even within that if the amount is less than 1 crore and you don't take approval from audit committee then you can audit committee can ratify it with three within three months and if not it is going to be voidable at the option of audit committee but if the amount is more than 1 crore and the transaction is specified under the under section 188 then either you can take approval transaction wise or you can take prior approval for maximum one year okay <clears throat> the for this audit committee is going to check how repetitive the transaction is and how justified the transaction is so based on that they will give prior approval for the whole year that okay this is the maximum value that during the whole year maximum up to 1 crore you can enter into transaction or maximum up to 10 crores per value transaction is not going to exceed 1 crore you have to make these disclosures these transactions are not permitted and i'm going to review from time to time okay so this by imposing such conditions audit committee can grant omnibus approval for related party transactions which need approval under section 188 clear if you contravene this penalty is there this is the penalty which is given under section 178 clear now audit committee is also required to oversee vigil mechanism what do we mean by vigil mechanism vigil mechanism is set up for the benefit of employees for the benefit of directors so they can report their concerns their grievances directly a lot of times it happens that employees are being caught in the web of manager or the exact upper hierarchy they cannot they don't have the access to move to higher authorities they don't have any access to complain they don't have any medium to complain right even if they go to their own manager for complaining about him only he is not going to listen so for such purposes for the companies if your company is a listed company if your company has accepted public deposits or if your company has borrowing more than 50 crores then in these situations it is mandatory for the company to establish vigil mechanism okay now vigil mechanism is just a system where you can register your complaints where you can have access to people who will listen and resolve your problems for the companies which have audit committee 
audit committee oversees the virtual mechanism in many companies it may so happen that you don't have audit committee but because you have accepted some public deposits you are uh, you are required to establish a virtual mechanism and therefore you do it so in such a situation the board is going to nominate a person to oversee virtual mechanism it also happens a lot of times that people take undue advantage of the system and they file unnecessary or frivolous complaints so in such a situation action will be taken against that employee also <coughs> i'm sorry clear fine so this was about section 177 now we move to section 178 nrc and src who is required to establish nrc and for what reason nrc is again being established by those companies who are required to have independent director or who are required to constitute audit committee so the same companies are also required to constitute nrc what is nrc meant for NRC is going to identify persons who should be appointed as director who are deserving ones who are required in the senior management who should be removed formulate the criteria in fact uh, even develop the uh, criteria for evaluation of the performance of board that he is a director who is performing really well or he is in the senior management he can be promoted as a board of directors so this is the criteria that i have developed for evaluation of performance like who attends uh, at least seven board meetings so this is the criteria that they have maybe set up now this can be evaluated by them only or it can be evaluated by some external agency also or by the board also right so all this is the function of nrc the composition of nrc is slightly different than audit committee here you need three directors only non executive directors three or more at least three non executive directors of whom half shall be independent directors of whom half shall be independent directors now whoever is the chairperson of the company can become the member of nrc but he will not be the chairperson of nrc he is the chairperson of company he is an executive director he can still be the member of nrc but he will not be the chairperson of nrc clear okay then we have stakeholders relationship committee ideally when we talk about stakeholders we include everyone be it government be it our suppliers be it our employees be it our vendors all of that but here stakeholders mean the persons who have invested into the company they are the security holders they are shareholders they are deposit holders as well they are debenture holders they are any other security holders so collectively if this number exceeds 1000 then comes the requirement of src that is stakeholders relationship committee what are they going to do vigil mechanism for the uh, reporting of complaints by employees this is also for reporting of complaints or grievances or problems of stakeholders some might not have received the dividend some has the issue with respect to share warrant or etc etc there can be ample of things right so they can file their grievances stakeholders relationship committee a group of dedicated directors who are going to oversee that all the problems are being resolved or not so the basic idea is to protect the interest of all security holders okay not just your equity shareholders but all the shareholders right now sometimes it may so happen that i'm genuinely trying to resolve a problem but the other person is not listening at all or is in some other angle so if you have tried to resolve the problem in good faith and you are unable to do that then it will not be deemed to be contravention of the same okay so no contravention of inability to resolve the problem in good faith you have the penalty what is the penalty 5 lakh and 1 lakh section 177 plus section 178 
So if you contravene any of the provisions of these sections, then this is the penalty. Penalty on company, 5 lakh and penalty on officer in default, 1 lakh. Right? Now, section 179, powers of board. Or I can say powers exercisable only at a board meeting. See, first thing that you need to understand for this section is that what board of directors can do. Anything that a company can do, its board can. What company can do? Company has to comply with Companies Act. The board also has to comply with Companies Act. Company has to act within the purview of its memorandum of association. So will the board. So you have to understand that anything that a company is permitted to do, its board can do. But, but, there are some powers or there are some acts which only shareholders can do. Like altering the articles of association, a company is permitted to alter its articles even after it has been drafted. But this power has been specifically reserved for the shareholders. So such a thing cannot be done by the board of directors. So all the acts which a company can do within, within Act, MOA, AOA or any regulation which the shareholders have imposed in general meeting. So within these powers, board can do all the acts which company can do but board cannot do the things which are specifically reserved for the shareholders. Now, so board has ample of powers. Out of these ample of powers, there are certain things which have to be dealt at board meeting only. This powers, these powers cannot be exercised or these matters cannot be dealt through resolution by circulation. Okay. So BR in BM is needed. That is board resolution and board meeting is needed for transacting these items. That means whenever you want to call um, money on shares. See, I have given you a mnemonic of uh, learning this. I hope you remember that and you have learned this well. Calls on shares, buyback, issue of securities, approval of merger, diversified business, approval of financial statements, political contribution, takeover, appointment of KMP, internal statutory audit, removal of KMP. And then you have big power. Borrowing money, investment and giving loan guarantee security. These two are covered in section 186 and this is covered in section 180. So section 180, company can borrow, company can give loan, company can invest, company can give guarantee, company can give security. Company can do this. It is not such that these things are not permitted. These matters can be dealt only at a board meeting. However, these three, that is these three big powers, B-I-G, big powers can be delegated. You call a board meeting, you pass a board resolution, resolve that the power to borrow money has been delegated to managing director of the company. He is now empowered to borrow money on behalf of the company. The maximum amount that he can borrow is this, uh, etc, etc. So by imposing all those conditions, you can delegate the power to a managing director, manager, commercial, um, sorry, uh, the principal officer of the company or branch, right? He can be a director also. So I hope that's clear. Now, board of directors has all the powers which company has subject to act memorandum articles and regulations. Now, uh, there are around 13 matters which require board resolution at board meeting only then they can be discussed or they can be dealt with. How, out of these 13 matters, there are three matters which can be delegated, right? Now, we come to section 180, borrowing. 
this is the major thing that is given in this section. Section 179 tells us that the company can borrow, but to borrow it has to hold a board meeting. However, it may also be delegated to someone, but whatever power is delegated, it has to be within the limit which is given in section 180. What does section 180 tells us? Section 180 restricts the general and vast power that has been given to the board. The board can borrow. The board can borrow money. Section 180 tells, hold on. You can borrow only up to this amount. If you want to borrow more than this, you need to go to the members and take special resolution. You need to pass SR and take their approval. Moreover, you also need SR for these things. So in these four cases, SR is needed by the board of directors. Case number one. Company wants to sell its undertaking. What is undertaking? Undertaking is a separate unit. How do we identify whether a particular venture is an undertaking or not? If that particular venture is giving you or is worth 20% um, uh, of net worth, more than 20% of net worth or it's generating more than 20% of income, then it's an undertaking. So if you want to sell off that undertaking, the board cannot take decision on its own. It has to go to the shareholders and get a SR passed. If the company wants to sell only substantial amount of undertaking, not the whole undertaking, but a substantial amount of undertaking, what is substantial amount of undertaking? 20% of that undertaking. So if you want to sell that, then also you need SR. Clear? Sometimes on merger, you have received some amount. Company has received some amount. Now you want to use this amount for some purpose. It's not your money. It's the money of shareholders. You need to take their permission and then only you can use this amount. Supposedly, company has given some loan to a director. And can company give loan to a director? Yes, subject to section 185. Subject to section 185. Supposedly company has given loan to a director and now the director is unable to repay. The director comes to the company and says, I need one more year. The board says, okay, fine, fine, take it. Today is your day, tomorrow our day will come. No. The board does not have the power to give extension to the director. For this, you need SR. And lastly, if the amount of borrowing exceeds a particular limit, what is the limit that has been given? Borrowed plus proposed exceeds paid up capital, free reserves, securities premium. If this exceeds, then SR is needed. If it does not exceed, then SR is not needed. That means if your total borrowings are less than equal to um, paid up capital, free reserves or securities premium, then you don't need SR. If it exceeds that particular amount, then you need SR. In this section, in this particular point, we have a concept called as temporary loans. Temporary loans. What are they? Temporary loans. Like you have any short term loans, they are not going to be part of that borrowing. For example, if there are short term loans, short term loans 50 lakhs and then you have long term loans again 50 lakhs and the company proposes to borrow further 50 lakhs. So what will, how will I compute this limit? I will say that my existing borrowings is 50 lakhs and my proposed borrowing is 50 lakhs. So 1 crore is the total borrowings. Now if this amount exceeds this, then I need SR. So I will also calculate paid up capital plus premium plus free reserves and I'll see which one is higher. If, if, if my borrowings is less than or within that limit, then I don't need SR, otherwise I need SR. Otherwise I need SR. Okay. Section 180 does not apply to a private company. So in private company, the board can borrow any amount that they want to. They don't need to get any special resolution. So for private companies, 
um, you can borrow any amount that you want to. There is no restriction or there is no limit which has been imposed. Fine. Section 181. Contribution to bona fide or charitable funds. This is a very small section. Company wants to contribute to these funds, you can. If you want to contribute up to this particular percent, it is within board's limit and if it exceeds more than 5%, then you need OR and then you can contribute. Then comes your section 182, which is political contribution. Again, uh, a lot of students have this problem that ma'am, why contribution, political contribution is so liberal that uh, any amount, you can contribute any amount. So I have told you the logic behind this, right? See, any company other than government and a company which has been in existence for less than three years, they can contribute, they can give any amount they want to to a political party. It's just that cash contribution is not allowed. They have to either contribute through check, draft, ECS or instrument. So they can. They just have to disclose in p and account. Okay, fine. Contribution to National Defense Fund. This is an overriding section. It overrides everything. It says that if company wants to contribute to ND, if National Defense Fund or any other approved fund for defense, go ahead. Even if your articles restrict you, then also you can. There will be no contravention, absolutely no. Okay, fine ma'am. If you contravene this, there is a penalty. Uh, this reminds me, if, if, if you contravene section 179, section 180, section 181, that is powers of board, uh, then you have um, restriction on powers of board and even if you have charitable contributions. These three sections that we read before, they don't have any penalty which has been specified. That means, ma'am, we have been given that we have to discuss this matter at board meeting only. But supposedly we discuss, don't discuss this matter at board meeting and we pass a board resolution by circulation. What is the penalty? You have the penalty which is not specified for the section. So you go to a specific section of penalty which is section 450, general section of penalty. So for all the sections where a specific penalty has not been specified under Companies Act, we have a general section, section 450. Now, disclosure of interest by director. A director has to give disclosure of interest. For this, again, we come back to our related party. For the students who have not done very thorough study, might the not understand that what is the connection between related party and section 184 ma'am section 188 is for related party section 184 is not for related party but you have to understand that there may be situations when both the section applies why because we have interest in our related parties no matter how uh, much we say that we are interested in our neighbors or this or that or this or that no we are interested in our family our relatives our people right if my mother is being appointed as uh, uh, one of uh, the employees of a particular company i'll be interested in that contract if some XYZ person is being appointed, I'll not be interested. So my interest is somehow connected with related party, though it may not always happen so. Now, if I am a director, I have to check in which companies I have the holding, in which firm I am a partner, where body corporate, where association I'm interested. And I have to give all these details in the first board meeting in which I'm participating as a director. I've been appointed as a director in the first board meeting that I participate, I have to give this disclosure. Thereafter, every year in the first board meeting, I'll give disclosure. And if there is any change in my uh, interest, then after the change in interest, the first board meeting that happens, there also I'll give disclosure. So I have to give disclosures in this manner. The form specified is MBP 1. I give the disclosure, the company maintains a registered MBP 4 for recording these things. Okay, fine. There is another subsection, section 184.2, which is more important for examination point of view that deals with specific disclosure 
specific disclosure. Now this is when the company enters into a contract or arrangement with body corporated firm and the director of the company is interested in such body corporate or firm. Now this interest has been specified. Section 184 interest has not been specified so you have to give disclosure in all respect. But here you have to give disclosure only when you hold more than 2% of paid up capital or your promoter or manager of CEO and uh, or sorry partner or owner of the firm in case of firm. So you have to if above situation arises then this director must disclose his interest in the board meeting in which first time the contract is discussed and he shall not participate in it. Supposedly there is contravention of the same the contract becomes voidable such director has to vacate office and there will be a fine of 1 lakh on interested director. On interested director. Okay. Again, it does not apply to private company because in private company, the directors who are interested, they can vote. After giving the disclosure, they can vote. Fine. Moving on to our next section, section 185, that is loans to directors. See, the first thing, company is prohibited to give. loan guarantee or security to the directors of the company, the directors of holding company, the relative of such director, partner of such director and a firm in which such director or relative is a partner. So you cannot give loan guarantee or security to your director, to your uh, directors of holding company and to other concerns in which the directors are related. This is the logic, this is the section which it says, but then it has exceptions. See section 185 deals with such a situations when there is loan guarantee or security to the directors or its concerned entities. If the director is not related to any entity, this case does not fall under section 185 because section 185 deals with loans to directors etc. So we are talking about loans, giving loans to director directly or giving loans to the entities in which such director, in which director is interested. So one is that prohibition, you cannot give to these people. Second is that you are permitted to give to certain people in which director is interested if you pass SR. If you pass SR. Okay ma'am. Permitted to give loan to or loan to or guarantee or security to private company in which director is a director or member. Body corporate whose board according, acts according to us and body corporate in which we hold more than equal to 25% of voting power. So you can give to such entities in which director is interested. Loan can be given to such body corporates in which the director is interested if explanatory statement is given to the members and SR is being passed. Clear? Now, it's not applicable to private company if no body corporate has invested in that private company and the borrowings are within this limit and there is no default. It is also not applicable to government company if they have obtained the necessary approval from their respective ministry and no default of filing. Moreover, it is not applicable if loan is made to MD or WTD as employee. They are non -exec they are executive directors, right? That means they are employees of the company. So just like advanced salary can be given to other employees, it can be given to these directors also. So fine. There might be some um, scheme which has been released by the company and in pursuance of that scheme you can take loan so you can take loan not a problem there might be a situation when you give loan in ordinary course of business like nbfc or banking company it is their business to give loan so just like they give loan to other customers they have given loan to director also but obviously when you give loan to your internal employees to your internal directors you give loan at some reduced rate 
in any situation your rate should not be less than the government security yield if you will give loan to your wholly owned subsidiary if you give guarantee to your wholly owned subsidiary guarantee or security to your wholly owned subsidiary so these are the exceptional cases where it is permitted right where it is permitted moving on to next section loans investments etc by a company a very small section section 186 or uh, rather i would say it has two perspective sorry 186 is not a small section it has two perspective one is putting a restriction on layering of investment companies and the second is um, uh, lgsi limit first thing you need to understand for this section is what do you mean by investment companies and since you have to understand about investment company i'm going to take you over here investment companies what whose principal business is investing how do you identify whether a company is investment company or not see if i want to check i open a balance sheet of any company if that's a factory it will have a lot of assets as plant and machinery so i come to know okay a lot of manufacturing is taking place in this company likewise if i open the balance sheet of an investing company i will see lot of assets as investments only so more than 50 percent shall be them or if i check the pnl account i will see more than 50 percent of its income is coming from that investment sources only right so that's how i identify whether a company is an investment company or not although we can talk about any type of company there is a restriction on number of layers of subsidiaries but this section 186 talks about investment companies only it restricts the number of layers of subsidiaries to maximum two it does not mean that a company cannot have more than two subsidiaries undoubtedly it can have hundreds of subsidiaries but it cannot have more than two layers of subsidiaries which means a company has a subsidiary this company has another subsidiary and this company has another subsidiary so layer one layer two and layer three so layer third is not permitted fine and there are exceptions what are the exceptions banking company nbfc with net worth more than 500 crore government company insurance company these are the exceptions one more thing that wholly owned subsidiary is not counted as a separate layer that is merged with that company only and 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 we have a company this company acquires a foreign company it becomes a subsidiary now this foreign company already has five subsidiaries five layers of subsidiaries i would say one two three four five and this is something which is permitted in that country so this foreign company is not doing anything unlawful it is a lawful act and now you want to acquire you want to make this foreign company as your subsidiary an indian company wants to make this foreign company as their subsidiary you can so if indian company uh, is a foreign company sorry if the investing company is a foreign company with permitted more layers as per foreign law it is allowed now we have other provisions of section 186 this is lgsi loan to any person or body corporate guarantee with respect to the loan security with respect to the loan or investment in body corporate this is shortly known as lgsi for this you need unanimous board resolution so for giving loans to anyone for giving guarantee for giving security or for investing in any body corporate you need ubr more than that apart from ubr if the ceiling limit exceeds you also need approval from members you also need approval from members so what are the cases ubr is must in all cases if lgsi made plus proposed does not exceed the limit which has been specified what is the limit this is the limit higher of 60 percent of paid up capital plus free reserves plus securities premium or 100 percent of free reserves plus securities premium so you check this limit you compute this limit if your lgsi which is already there plus proposed exceeds this amount you need sr if it does not exceed this amount no sr is required okay now 
if it does not exceed the limit no sr needed you just need ubr plus you need pfi approval if there is default in repayment if there is no default in repayment no problem fine but if your lgsi exceeds this limit you need br ubr you also need or uh, sorry sr as well as you also need pfi approval ma'am even if there is no default yes if it exceeds limit you need pfi approval also fine apart from this whatever loan you are giving at least this has to be the rate the minimum rate is going to be at least yield of government security closest to the tenure right when we compute uh, this 60% of paid up share capital we have to take capital as both preference plus equity as well as we de uh, deduct call sell arrears which have not been received because we are computing paid up capital so whatever has been received that only is taken there has to be no subsisting default with respect to deposits if there is you cannot go for lgsi disclosure has to be fully made in the financial statements okay full disclosure in financial statements apart from this uh, there is a register for lgsi which is being maintained mbp2 this register is also going to be open for inspection by the members and uh, there is contravention if the company contravenes these provisions minimum fine 25000 maximum 5 lakhs so your fine can range between this on the company and officer in default imprisonment uh, less than equal to 2 years and again fine between that fine section 187 a very small section whatever investments you are holding whatever assets you are holding whatever securities you are holding it has to be in your own name and in your own possession simple that is the general rule so company if it is holding any investment it has to be in company's name only however there are certain exceptions sometimes it is important that you have uh, for compliance of law you have to hold it uh, in your nominee's name hold shares sometimes you give it to the bank for collection of dividends sometimes you have to transfer it to the bank for facilitating sale sometimes you transfer it uh, rather give it as a pledge for obtaining loan sometimes uh, when your shares are in dmat form you're not the registered owner your depository is the registered owner and you're just the beneficial owner so in these situations investments might not be in your own name for this you have to prepare a register in mbp3 which is going to be kept at the registered office preserved permanently and is going to be open for inspection section 188 again we have a punishment also for this 5 lakh and 50000 okay section 188 related party transactions now see whatever transaction is happening between the company and its related party not all the transactions are covered under section 188 first of all if they are at arms length price in the ordinary course of business they are not covered secondly if they are not at arms length price in ordinary course then we have to check whether they are covered under the specified seven transactions what are the specified seven transactions sale purchase or supply of goods or material disposing of property leasing of property availing or rendering of services then with or without agent that is clause e then appointment of opp office or place of profit underwriting of security so these are the seven specified transactions if if the company enters into a contract or arrangement with related party the transaction which is specified under section 188 you need br if it exceeds the limit you also need or simple for br for br notice of br will be uh, notice of board meeting will be sent with agenda explaining everything at board meeting resolution will be passed the interested director is refrained from is abstained from uh, participating and voting next thing is we have to check whether it exceeds the limit or not if it exceeds the limit the notice of general meeting will be sent along with the explanatory statement 
and the ordinary resolution will be passed related member will not vote if it does not exceed no or is required no or is required right transactions between 100 person subsidiary and holding no or is required whatever transaction is being entered with the related party will be adequately disclosed in uh, both's report the next question arises in our mind that now what is the limit what is the limit if it exceeds limit we need or but what is the limit the limit sale purchase of goods material with or without agent more than equal to 10 percent of turnover or property more than equal to 10 percent of net worth leasing more than equal to 10 percent of turnover services more than equal to 10 percent of turnover two lakh fifty thousand per month and one percent of net worth exceeds that now if the contract needed approval from board or approval from members but that necessary approval was not acquired and the transaction took place the contract was entered into what happens in that case does the contract become void the answer is no it becomes voidable first of all it can be ratified within three months even if it is not ratified it becomes voidable at the option of the board or the members whatever the case be right if there is any director who is involved he is going to indemnify the company for the loss okay you have the penalty uh, in case of listed company 25 lakh in case of unlisted or others 5 lakhs right now we have very small small sections remaining section 189 the register so for section 184 for section 188 you have to maintain the register mbp4 the register is going to be preserved permanently kept in the custody of company secretary when we give disclosure under section mbp1 that uh, details are going to be included in the trans uh, in the register register will be kept at the registered office it is going to be open for inspection produced at every general meeting and there is a penalty for non maintenance that is 25000 then comes section 190 which talks about the contracts of employment uh, with MD or WTD. See, whenever a company is uh, appointing MD or WTD, it enters into a contract of employment. If there is no contract of employment, then it will at least have a memorandum of understanding where the terms are being boiled down uh, to writing, right? Whatever it is, it has to be kept at the registered office of the company and which is going to be open for inspection for members. This is not uh, for private companies so only in public companies this is going to be an open uh, thing for members right uh, again there is a penalty fine less than equal to 25,000 and 5,000 respectively for company and officer in default section 191 is somehow related to 202 because here we compensate for the loss of office section 202 gives compensation only to MD, WTD and manager however this section gives compensation to all the directors in case of sale of undertaking, sale of shares, takeover, there is any loss of office to the directors, then they can get compensation which is not going to exceed the compensation given under section 202. So within that limit, the compensation can be given. Compensation can be given undoubtedly to the executive directors as well as non-executive directors. So when I'm talking about executive directors, there are some restrictions. Since they are involved directly in uh, repayment of deposits, repayment of debentures, repayment of bank loan taxes, then payment of employee dues or uh, dividend to preferentials or redemption of preferentials. If there is any default in all these, they will not be entitled to get compensation. The non-executive directors will still be entitled, but they will not be entitled. Right. Moreover, an additional point to note over here is with respect to the quorum. Usually, um, see one, one, one more important thing, when we are talking about section 191, we give compensation to all the directors by passing ordinary resolution. So when we are passing ordinary resolution, it may so happen that the meeting was adjourned and at the adjourned meeting also the quorum was not there. So deemed quorum and the resolutions were passed, this shall not be passed. No deemed approval in case of this section. Okay. Penalty 1 lakh. Then we come to section 192. Uh, <coughs> restrictions on non cash transactions. That is a kind of barter system. Again, this is not going to happen unless ORS passed. 
So if you want to enter into any transaction with a director which is non-cash, you have to take prior approval uh, by OR and the value shall be determined by the registered valuer. If it is not so obtained, if the approval is not so obtained, the transaction will be voidable at the option of the company. Okay. Lastly, we have section 193 that is contract by one person company. It is uh, absolutely nothing. One person company is entering into a contract with the sole member who is the director also. So what, what disclosures you will give, what board meeting you will hold, what uh, permissions you will take, nothing required. You just have to enter it in the minutes book and you have to inform the ROC within 15 days about the transaction entered into because he's a related party, right? So that's how uh, things will take place. That's it with this particular chapter.